Breastfeeding doula and postpartum support group, and we had a very amazing and beautiful conversation. We did um, kind of across the board just what support would look like, and in, in general, these were our key takeaways that came, the themes that came out of all of the various levels of support that we talked about. No, no surprise there that the most important thing that came out was how to center any of this work that we were talking about, centering support, centering breastfeeding policy, centering postpartum support, re-entry support, any of the different topics that we talked about have to be centered in the lived experience of people who have been incarcerated. And that means that that makes the work really hard because you have to constantly stay slow in the game. Your turn. Oh my goodness. Sorry for doing <laughs> Kind of going along the same thing, we want to be able to listen to and um, we don't want to say empower, but uh, help people find their own power that have been that are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, um, to be able to hold them up, listen to the voice, and to pay them dollars for their emotional labor. Nobody bleeds for free. <laughs> um, and then where am I at? Oh, and so the next thing we talked about was the power of racism and classism and how that impacts how we do this work. So, um, and when we were originally talking about, at the, towards the end, we were talking about the idea of postpartum screening and the impact that that has on the various different populations within, an, within formerly incarcerated and currently, as well as in general population. So like looking at the effects of racism and classism when looking at screening means understanding the impact of being screened for postpartum depression. And if you have a medical provider in front of you or a service provider in front of you and you've chosen not to take medication for that, for that predicament that you're in, the effect that that has as somebody who maybe ha comes from uh, an affluent class background a, and it identifies as maybe straight, is white, any one of those more dominant features that tend to get the privilege side of things, the, if the answer to that question is, okay, well then what is your, what is your, uh, what other ways do you wanna look for support? Whereas we often find that people who come from the more marginalized uh, populations of our community, if they say no, then they have DCF in their life. So really understanding the impact of racism and classism and what that means in making these choices and centering the voice. And uh, do you want me to finish or you want to um, I think that, yeah, the last one of the, the uh, one that I really has a heart for me is being able to hold space for formerly and currently incarcerated people and the trauma that they're experiencing centered around being a mother, being pregnant in prison and giving birth in prison and, and being able to do that in spaces outside of here but in, in the world and back in our at home base. So the, the solutions that we came up with was let people speak for themselves, like tell their own story, story, their social biography, to understand the trauma where they come from. As well, we spoke about high school, college credit, vocational, like continue with your education in prison or in county jail, wherever you're at. Um, we talked about culture-based therapy, like going back into your community and touching with your cultural, having your community help you out with your healing, um, getting back to the youth or getting back to your community to try to help. Um, being your expert in your own life. Um, leadership roles inside, having um, like basically being a leader inside the prison or inside the county jail. Um, and we talked about being accountable on both sides. So like I'm working with probation and I asked why, why is it that they don't just open up to us when we say we won't arrest them if they'll just talk with us and be open and then they point out that we turn around and arrest them when they tell us. Yeah. So on our side, we need to be more accountable and fulfill what we're telling them that we're going to be doing and working with them instead of just incarcerating them. But on the other side, we have programs, that, I don't know everything here in California, but we have programs like the Workforce Services where they can be looking for a job with someone five days a week, eight hours a day, and they have people who work specifically with probationers, and they get jobs within two weeks. And we send people there, but no one shows up. This whole year, on my case, I've only had three people actually do it. So on their side, people who are wanting to make the changes need to be accountable for what they're doing as well. But if we can both just open up, listen to each other a lot more, 
and break that barrier between the two sides, then we can actually move along. Also evolve rehab to healing, to be able to heal from what we go through. It's important to heal so we can move forward. If we don't heal, we're not gonna be able to move forward. We're still gonna be mad and we're still gonna go through, through those emotions trying to move forward. So it's hard. We gotta start by healing with, with, with each other. And then we also were talking about how we need to have funding for these things so that we can actually provide more community-based stuff. So the money that's going towards prison and incarceration, if we can somehow shift that towards helping people with education and other forms of rehab. Or putting the money back into the community. But on that side, it would also have to be more accountability on Both the other sides. side as well. It's a two-way thing for it to work. <coughs> Okay, so our highlights were of the two, because we combined the two, um, were challenges to ensure care. Our main focus here, we said the role and goal of corrections is punishment. The role and goal of healthcare is healing. How do we reconcile the two? Because they're two different fundamentals, and we decided education would be the key for doing that. And then here, we wanted to replicate and build on the processes that work without reinventing the wheel. And our best solution for that was creating a clearing house, clearing house for all of the resources that we have in place where we can all network and work with each other to get things done. Here, we wanted to know what was the best way to enforce the standards. And we decided that coming up with an organization similar to JCO that's not a correctional entity, but outside of corrections, to do centralized monitoring and tie it to laws with funding where they're fined if they don't comply. And our long-term goal to end shackling, we decided was to ensure long-term goals of healthy moms and babies and be able to raise their babies in a safe and dignified environment. And um, our action item, once we looked at all of this. Uh, yes. Our action item, um, when we looked at all of this, is we want to clearly identify the birth center in every county that is attached to a jail or a prison. And then from that information, create a clearinghouse of all of that information, as well as all of the allies that are involved in those different counties. And then from there, in terms of pulling education into the field, um, creating standardized trainings for all the healthcare providers, as well as everyone in DOC and all of those systems of how to actually work with pregnant women and um, work with healthcare providers um, for creating good care for them to end shackling and of course just their prenatal care, postpartum care in general. Um, so then we're gonna build a national campaign on that. Woo! <laughs> main takeaway is that to trust moms and that mothers should be the number one place where the choices are made, uh, that there be unbiased support within the incarceration setting uh, to help women make those decisions, uh, that infant placement is not something that is in the, should go to uh, through child welfare and that it's not a formula. Um, and that uh, the respect that mothers know best, what's best for their babies, and support for reunification and a lot of contact visits. Um, from there, we went into somewhat larger view around, you know, sort of beginning to look at sort of, well, what is driving the incarceration of women? Because if we can reduce the number of women that are incarcerated, particularly pregnant women in this case, then we have less of these problems that we have to deal with. So we talked about the drivers of incarceration for women being substance use, mental, we need subs better substance use treatment, mental health resources, um, education, access to safe, and safe housing, uh, jobs, uh, trauma treatment and recovery, particularly around sexual assault. And that leads to a reduction of racism and poverty as the driving forces that uh, lead to incarceration of women. And then, um, and to really address those, we talked a little bit, we began to run out of time at that point, so we talked some about that. We want more community policing and less warrior cops um, that uh, 
the communities can really kind of control themselves as opposed to having people coming from the outside uh, making those decisions and driving people into incarceration. And then there were a bunch of things that we weren't able to get to that we would have liked to. One thing was around models, like uh, around developing really strong models for prenatal and postnatal support. Um, somewhat similar to visiting nurses associations, using things that work in the community. Um, we didn't really talk about, but we think it's very important to look at the particularities around undocumented um, mothers and the protections that they need, particularly around um, safety, around being able to uh, leave their abusers, for example, without fear of being um, deported. Uh, we think that children have a right to a lifelong relationship with their uh, parents and that that should be the driving force. Oh, and then profit-driven incentives, which include everything from private uh, prisons as well as uh, DAs and prosecutors and uh, probation officers and people who really their, lives, their livelihoods are dependent on increasing incarceration. We think that needs to end. So we were the data group, um, and we had a really fantastic conversation, but we want to boil it down to three th major points. Um, there was a lot of discussion around how representative are the PIPs data in terms of, um, obviously, the sites were a convenient sample, and so how do we extrapolate the data that we have to make national recommendations um, with the information that's available? Uh, we talked a lot about strategic dissemination and streamlined messages. So we talked a lot about who were the stakeholders that needed to hear um, the messages about the PIP da PIPs data. So it has to be beyond corrections, right? And it needs to be in multiple forms of dissemination. So we talked about, we, get, we gave you some ideas, Carolyn, on particular journals to submit to, conferences to attend, stakeholders to target. Uh, there's a whole list of acronyms on there that we'll let you decipher. Um, you and Lauren could have a whole a lot of fun um, trying to figure out what we meant and really we talked about like streamlined messages so thinking about all of these data points what are three to four key messages that need to come out of the data and we gave you some ideas about what our takeaways were from the data um, and then the last point on there is um, what comes from here? So how do we continue the PIPs data and sort of what are the systems that are in place um, or not in place in terms of structure and buy-in to continue collecting data, uh, increasing the number of sites to make it representative, but also providing facilities with the opportunity to continue so that we have data in 2018 and 2019 and so on so that we can make some um, informed decisions as we move forward about trends over time good so we were abortion access for incarcerated women so um, some of the obstacles that we talked about was the lack of knowledge um, the violation of privacy um, identifying medical rights state by state the lack of access and medically incarcerated information um, and the fact that we're held by force <clears throat> And then from that, <laughs> um, we kind of just, Dana White, I am not. Okay. <laughs> we talked about some ways um, to implement change. So creating safe places um, from a reproductive justice approach, um, maybe implementing an initial screening for positive pregnancy tests. So when someone has a positive, positive pregnancy test, you can ask them, do they want to continue this pregnancy initial, initially, um, or do they want to talk to someone? And by when we say someone, a qualified someone. Um, and um, it was an idea to have a required data tracker um, on a legislative level. Um, and then also uh, grassroots work, so work that is done outside of um, the facilities and you know at home and and things like that so some of the resources that we came up with um, and this is just a few but there is the United Nations language um, also there was a bill passed in California for non -co -co I can't say this word coercive <laughs> consulting um, City Council Developing Policies for Sheriffs. 
Um, we testify, which is what I'm a part of, for just storytelling and being that avenue. Um, and then a bell trap, which is made by the Brave New Films. So that's another resource that you, might, you guys might want to explore. So that's us. Well, thank you um, to all of you and to the leaders for coming forward to represent your groups. Um, it's been an incredible um, couple of hours of breakout sessions, but of course an incredible day. And again, um, Lauren and Alicia and I want to thank you all so much for giving up a Sunday. <laughs> Let's just put that out there. <laughs> giving up a Sunday to come talk about some really hard issues um, and to brainstorm ideas. And as we said from the outset, um, while there have been some powerful conversations today and connections, this is not just about today. We want to move what has happened in this room outside of this room and harness the ideas and energy. And so how do we make that happen, you may ask. Um, some of it will be an emergent strategy, um, but there are some things that are, are going to happen. Before I do that, before I tell you about what the next steps are from us to stay in touch with you um, and continue the action, a few housekeeping items. Um, it looks like actually people have already done a good job of cleaning up, but if you have a cup or your empty lunchbox, if you could just take that and get rid of that um, on your way out. There are some extra lunch boxes. Please feel free to take them with you. Um, I think they haven't been out for too long, so um, you can take them with you. Um, as I mentioned, the data that we shared today are preliminary, so please do not share them um, and disseminate them widely. I promise you all will be among the first to get our final reports so that you can share them. Um, and uh, oh, also a reminder, we haven't, we didn't really formally announce, there, as you probably already know, there's a resource table outside with a few resources. It includes things like the breastfeeding position statement, um, so please feel free to take things with you on the way out. Um, and then any of you who have um, agreed, or even if you haven't been approached yet, but you're interested in giving just a brief um, couple minute reflection on why you came here, um, you know, what you got out of it, what you're going to do um, for our video. Um, if you could just stay for a few minutes afterwards, that would be great. Um, so what are, what are the next steps? Um, well, most of you registered either through our Eventbrite page or through AJFO, and so we have your email addresses. But if you did not, and if you came you know, at the last minute because you thought it was interesting, which is great, we're happy you were here, um, please see me or Lauren um, in the green shirt in the back um, so that we have your contact information because we are planning on um, following up with everybody um, via email. Um, and in that follow-up, we're going to do several things. One, we're going to ask for your permission. Um, um, or not, you can certainly decline, but to share your, your name and email address um, for the list of everyone who is here today so that you don't, I mean, it's great to exchange business cards today if, or email addresses in whatever way, um, but this way there's a more centralized way to do that. So if you don't have, if you need to rush out of here, we'll take care of coordinating that. But let us know if you are willing to opt in. Um, we're also going to create a summary, um, not only of the general um, aspects of today, but a summary of the comments on the data. That's what we're saving all your post-its, so please don't take any of the papers with you. And a summary of um, the breakout groups, so much more detail than what we heard from the group leader so that all of your good work gets um, recorded and conveyed um, and, um, and put down on, on paper so that we can move forward on some of these action plans. Um, and then um, staying in touch um, is not only over individual email, but one idea that was presented was, is there a role for creating a listserv? Now, we certainly don't want to replicate, uh, reinvent the wheel. Um, we know a lot of you are already on listservs, and there's one already for California um, uh, for, pregnant, for reproductive health in prisons and jails. Um, but we need, to, we need a national coalition, a national communication um, system, and so one idea is a Listserv, so we will ask you that in our follow-up as well. Um, we do need someone to maintain that. So if there is interest, we will also be looking for um, a few volunteers, uh, reflecting, of course, on the, the, complica the complicated nation, uh, notion of volunteering that we've talked about today. Um, but this may form the basis of a clearinghouse for resources that we talked about today, and not reinventing all of the great things that already exist out there. 
Um, lastly, as you know, we've been um, recording today's events. We're going to um, create a video, and we will share that with you. And you can share that with your partners um, and collaborators. Um, but we also want to um, we also want to be able to find ways to share it with people who are who couldn't be here today, who are because they're incarcerated right now. And we hope that the National Council, in particular, will be helpful in um, in finding ways to get that to those women. Um, so that's sort of um, the, the next steps, and I know they're not concrete plans like, okay, but, but where's the policy? Where's the law? Where that, we can't accomplish all of that in a short day. So this is really just the catalyst, we hope the start of the next steps of seeing people face to face. There will be phone calls, emails, we hope, um, and, and future projects that will implement some of the great ideas that you have come up with. Um, so with that, um, the, you know, one of the things that came up in our group, I was in the medical standards, and we actually talked a little bit about photography and art as an agent of social change and of educating the public. And um, uh, I, I feel very strongly in the, in the power, of, as I'm sure some of, many of you do as well, about the power of art and the role of art in our community and our society. And so in that vein, I am truly honored and really excited um, for the, the closing words and energy um, that's going to close out this space. Um, Alicia Coleman um, with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners um, is going to share with us um, some of her poetry, um, which is a real treat. Um, so thank you. Um, and if you're not familiar with the good work of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, they are a, an impressive and effective group that has done a lot to support um, incarcerated women in the state of California. So without further ado, Alicia Coleman, thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to be... Um, this poem, I wrote this poem because it was, it, was in, it was pertaining to the situation that we have up against us. So the way I wrote it, it was in the, um, kind of like in the eyes of a young lady who was on her way to prison and didn't know how to really communicate with the officer. And I decided to name it Shackles. So um, it goes, sir, would you please take these shackles off my feet? I'm really hot and I have to pee. I have swollen ankles and high blood pressure. My baby's due soon, so it sits on my bladder. I don't want to complain, but I'm really in pain. My head is spinning and I feel faint. Would you please release these, release my feet from the restraints? The guard's reply to my cry was this. Everyone is uncomfortable. You just have to deal with it. It won't be long now. We're almost to the prison. But if you got to go that bad, you might as well start pissing. I'm not a doctor or your child's father. My job is to make sure you're transferred from one jail to another. But my mouth is dry. My stomach is tight. Around my lips is completely white. It hurts so bad, I'm seeing lights. It feels like number two, but number one just happened. My clothes are soaked. I think my water just broke. So maybe now you'll have to drive a little faster. I don't want to give birth in the back of a van. That just was not a part of my plan. The guard said, I can only go as fast as I can. You kind of women, I don't understand. Say you love your child, but you're doing this time for a man. Do you think he... He cares if you're shackled in the back of this van. If I uncuff you, I have to do it for everyone, and then I'm responsible if you try to run. I won't run, I promise. I can barely walk. I just want to lay down and put my legs up. I feel like pushing. I feel like crying. The pain is so intense, I really feel like dying. Every two to three minutes, my stomach feels sore. There's pain in my private area like never before. Please take these shackles off my feet. I can't take it no more. The guards reply, next time you commit a crime, try not to get caught. You can quit your complaining now. We're pulling up. So in the midst of all that, the doors swing open. Lights enter. Call a nurse. This lady is injured. Everyone's scrambling. Get a stretcher. Cuts off her clothes. The baby's head is exposed. Airwave closed. Emergency surgery. Doctor saved it, though. So there was no complaints of restraints. She was just scarred for life, spent 18 hours with the baby, then it was gone for life, when in actuality they should have just been barred for life. And that was it. Thank you. I get nervous every time I do this. You know? But I, I just I wrote that because it was just like my depiction of what it's like when I've either seen women who were in situations and they were pregnant and they didn't know how to tell the person who they were with 
that, you know, I'm in pain and I'm hurting because most guards that transfer women to facilities, either it be a jailhouse or a doctor's appointment, they don't know what we go through. And it's really not their job. So it was like just my depiction of what that's like. Thank you. Thank you.